Our Holy Father, St. Augustine, has powerful lines on the sacrament of life, the Blessed Sacrament itself. He exclaimed, Although God is all-powerful, he is unable to give more. Though supremely wise, he knows not how to give more. Though vastly rich, he has not more to give. So this is the greatest gift that we have on earth, the centre of the Church's life. It differentiates the Catholic Church from any other body. It is the tabernacle of God among men. And so we must protect to the maximum of our ability the tabernacle of the Most High. And we become that tabernacle. I take up again some words that this Lord himself gave to us through this modern chosen soul, Catalina. She's one of us, and the Lord just makes use of the poorest of the poor. The more humble the person is, the more there is a risk of it being authentic. Interesting that he should come to Latin America. So I'd like to quote some of the teaching the Lord gave us through her, lest we forget what we are doing when we're in the house of God. Her eyes and ears were opened that we might see and hear. Let us too be humble enough to listen. Maybe the Lord has something to teach us. We can push away many graces because we think they're not authentic and we know it all already. So, with regard to the penitential rite, she heard this in her heart. From the bottom of your heart, ask the Lord to forgive your faults that have offended him. In this way, you'll be able to participate worthily in this privilege of assisting at the Holy Mass. Then she had this thought, surely I'm in the state of grace. I went to confession last night. And here she hears, no actually it's the Blessed Virgin who's, <coughs> she's hearing at this point, Do you think that since last night you have not offended the Lord? Let me remind you of a few things. <coughs> when you left home to come here, the girl who helps you approached you to ask you something. And as you were late and in a hurry, you did not answer her in a very nice way. That was lack of charity on your part. And you say you have not offended God. Now we notice here <coughs> that the question of being flustered comes in. And we celebrants know that this is a major problem in dysfunctionality in the whole realm of liturgy. Being flustered. There's an old saying in French, Tension est mauvaise conseillère. Tension is a bad counsellor. And actually, in church documents, it is indicated the sacristy is a place of recollection and silence. And when people talk in the sacristy, certainly when they talk about things have nothing to do with liturgy, what they're about to celebrate, it's a thorough nuisance for the celebrant. He needs to be allowed to recollect himself and to get into mode already. It's the antechamber of glory, and one can't crash into the sacred. <coughs> but 
getting there on time is important and therefore already not having to rush and do things badly before so one is just getting in time and not with a space or a margin <coughs> it's a good policy actually to have a margin already prepared so that one is prepared for any eventuality always therefore arriving a good while before not just on time then while you were on the way here <coughs> a bus crossed your lane and almost hit you you expressed yourself in a very inappropriate manner against that poor man instead of saying your prayer and preparing yourself for Mars. One time the Kira Mars did not give communion to a person who was there at the altar rail and she was taken aback and he explained to her you came here without even saying your morning prayers you rushed and her soul was not in the state necessary to receive the Lord properly it was a lesson to that girl and through her to us also you have failed in charity and lost your peace and patience and you say you have not hurt the Lord. You arrive at the last minute when the procession of the celebration is already coming out to celebrate the Mass and you are going to participate without previous preparation. And now one sees, despite the instructions of the Church on this point, sometimes concelebrants coming in after the beginning. And this teaching is given from on high. You should have arrived earlier to be able to pray and ask the Lord to send his Holy Spirit that he may grant you a spirit of peace, peace. and cleanse you of the spirit of the world, your worries, your problems, and your distractions so as to enable you to live this sacred moment because what happens is that if one comes in that flustered mode the beginning at least of the celebration is going to remain in that mode and the head is full it's cluttered there has to be that dovetailing into the sacred and that's made of calm it's made of peace That's why the early celebrations, the very early ones, are usually more interiorized because there's nothing else happened first. If one is fasting, if one is empty of all worry, the day is ahead and not behind, one is virgin territory to be worked upon. And a word from the Lord is the only word at that point. The head is not full of other words. So, this question is asked. You arrive almost when the celebration is about to commence, and you participate as if it were an ordinary event, without any spiritual preparation. Why? This is the greatest of miracles. You are going to live the moment when the Most High gives His greatest gift, and you do not know how to appreciate it. And then when he came to the Gloria, she heard, Glorify and bless with all your love the Holy Trinity in your acknowledgement of being one of his creatures. One of his creatures. Our duty is to recognize our creaturely state. The Gloria we share with the angels, it was heard there by the shepherds in some shape or form. And it comes from the early church, sung by all the Christians that have gone before us. 
and it's fitting that a hymn, a hymn, should be sung. It's questionable whether one could justify singing the Kyrie and saying a Gloria. It's liturgical nonsense. Both can be sung with little effort, but how many make the effort? The Word of God. I want you, she hears this voice, to be attentive to the readings and to the entire homily of the priest. And she's reminded that in Scripture it says, The Word of God does not return without bearing fruit. If you are attentive, Something from all that you heard in the homily will remain in you. Now that I've come across elsewhere. The Lord does put, through his Holy Spirit, a word in the preacher's mouth for this one and that one who is present, without the preacher knowing it. You should try to recall all day long the words of the homily, at other times the reading of the entire gospel, or perhaps only a certain word. Nourishment for the soul, isn't it? A word can stay with us all day. It can happen in next year divina as well. Savour them for the rest of the day, and it will then become part of you, because that is the way to change one's life. Allowing the word of God to transform you. And now tell the Lord that you are there to listen, that you want him to speak to your heart today. And Our Lady gave the same teaching at Medjugorje years ago, indicating that when one arrived in church, one should ask the Holy Spirit for that word. She begins to hear and see things at the offertory. Pray like this. And then she repeated these words after the Blessed Virgin. Lord, I offer you all that I am, all that I have, all that I can. I put everything into your hands. Build it up, Lord with the little thing that I am. By the merits of your divine Son, transform me, God Almighty. I petition you for my family, for my benefactors, for each member of our apostolate, for all those who fight against us, for those who commend themselves to my prayers. Teach me, Lord, to lay down my heart as if on the ground before them, so that, they, so that their walk may be less severe. This is how the saints pray. This is how I want all of you to pray. So Our Lady is teaching their humility, serviability, that element of being the ancella domini. One is just an ancilla, a maid servant, and one, therefore, is not in mode of being served, but of serving. The offertory contains that. The soul offers itself to serve. And also the Vatican Council does teach us that, that one offers oneself with the Lord. And all that one offers then is also taken up, our work. And in fact, that theme of work comes into the offertory prayers at present talks about the work that has gone behind making the gifts and that work is means a lot more because one is offering up one's daily labour. All is consecrated if one does it properly at the offertory. Our whole life becomes priestly. We are priests of creation and we also voice the praise of creation consciously which the animals do unconsciously. 
And then she begins to see things. Her mother said, observe. And she's seeing these angels. They are the guardian angels of each one of the persons who are here. This is the moment in which your guardian angel carries your offerings and petitions before the altar of the Lord. At that moment, she says, I was completely astonished because these beings had such beautiful faces, so radiant as one is unable to imagine. The countenance was very beautiful, almost feminine features. However, the structure of their body, their hands, their height was masculine. Their feet, which were bare, did not touch the floor, but rather they all moved as if gliding. What a beautiful procession that was. Some of them were seen carrying what appeared to be a golden bowl with something that shone a great deal with a golden white light. The Virgin Mary said, They are the guardian angels of the people who are offering this holy mass for many intentions. Those who are conscious of what this celebration means, they have something to offer the Lord. Offer yourselves at this moment. Offer your sorrows, your pains, your hopes, your sadness, your joys, your petitions. Remember, the Mass is infinite value. Therefore, be generous in offering and in asking. Behind the first angel came others who had nothing in their hands. They were coming empty-handed. Those are the angels of the people who are here, but never offer anything. They have no interest in living each liturgical moment of the Mass, and they have no gifts to carry before the altar of the Lord. At the end of the procession came other angels, who appeared rather sad. Their hands joined in prayer, but their eyes downcast. These are the guardian angels of the people who are here, but do not want to be. People who have been forced to come here, who have come out of obligation, but without any desire to participate in the Holy Mass. The angels go forth sadly because they have nothing to carry to the altar except for their own prayers. Do not sadden your guardian angel. Ask for much. Ask for the conversion of sinners, for peace in the world, for your families, your neighbours, those who ask for your prayers. Ask, ask for much, and not only for yourselves, but for everyone else. Remember that the offering which most pleases the Lord is the offering of yourself as a holocaust. Holocaust means a burnt offering completely consumed. So that Jesus, upon his descent, may transform, your, transform you by his own merits. What do you have to offer the Father by yourselves? Nothingness and sin. The offering of oneself, united to the merits of Jesus, is the offering that is most pleasing to the Father. Now, we are taught that after the words, Sursum Corda, in which the priest raises his hands, lift up your hearts, which is no Roman expression, it's actually about the Roman army. That moment there is a time when we leave behind anything which is less than God, and we concentrate entirely on the Most High. We're there joining the praise and prayer of the angels as we echo their song, heard by Isaiah, heard by John in the Apocalypse. Hagios, Hagios, Hagios. We share that with all liturgies of the world. And so she becomes conscious of things. The final moment of the preface arrived when the assembly said, Holy, holy, holy. Suddenly, everything that was behind the celebrants disappeared. 
Behind the left side of the archbishop, thousands of angels appeared in a diagonal line. Small angels, big angels, angels with immense wings, angels with small wings, angels without wings. As the previous ones, all were dressed with tunics like the white robes of the priests or altar boys. Everyone knelt with their hands united in prayer and bowed their heads in reverence. Beautiful music was heard as if there were many choirs with different voices, all singing in unison together with the people. Holy, holy, holy. And this was picked up at a mass celebrated by the great exorcist in Sicily, Father Matteo de la Grua, now unfortunately deceased. It was picked up because he was celebrating there before a large assembly and he knew that something was going to happen and it happened. It was all recorded and one can hear the angel singing as he comes to the consecration. The moment of the consecration, the moment of the most marvellous of miracles had arrived. Behind the right side of the archbishop appeared a multitude of people also in a diagonal line. They were dressed in the same tunic but in pastel colours of rose, green, light, blue, lilac, yellow, in short, in different and very soft colours. Their faces were also brilliant and full of joy. They all seemed to be the same age. You could note, but I can't say why, that they were people of different ages, but their faces looked the same, without wrinkles, happy. They all knelt down as well as at the singing of Holy Holy Holy. A lady explained, these are all the saints and the blessed of heaven, and among them are the souls of your relatives who already enjoy the presence of God. Then I saw her, exactly to the right of the archbishop, a step behind the celebrant. She was suspended a little off the floor, kneeling on some very fine, transparent, but at the same time luminous fabric, as crystalline water. The Holy Virgin, with hands joined, was looking attentively and respectfully at the celebrant. She spoke to me from there, but silently, directly to the heart, without looking at me. It surprises you to see me standing a little behind the Archbishop, does it not? This is how it should be. With all the love that my son gives me, he has not given me the dignity that he has given the priests that are being able to perform the daily miracle with my hands, as they do with their priestly hands. Because of this, I feel a deep respect for priests and for the miracle that God carries, and through them, which compels me to kneel here behind them. Right now, a close friend of mine is celebrating his first Holy Mass. He was ordained yesterday. It is a cosmic moment. Before the altar, there appeared some shadows of people in a grey colour, with their hands raised. The Holy Virgin said, These are blessed souls of purgatory, who await your prayers to be refreshed. Do not stop praying for them. They pray for you, but they cannot pray for themselves. It is you who have to pray for them, in order to help them depart. They can be with God and enjoy his presence eternally. Now, as you may see, I am here all the time. People go on pilgrimages to the places where I have appeared. This is good, because of all the graces they will receive there. But during no apparition in no other place am I more present than during the celebration of Holy Mass. You will always find me at the foot of the altar 
where the Eucharist is celebrated. At the door of the tabernacle I remain with the angels because I am always with him. There have been caught, actually, silhouettes of the Blessed Virgin in adoration by the Presence. To see that beautiful countenance of the Mother of God at the moment of the words, Holy, 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 as well as that of all the others, with their radiant faces, with hands joined, awaiting that miracle which repeats itself continuously, was to be in heaven itself. And to think there are people who can even at that moment be distracted in conversation. It hurts me to tell you, many men, more than women, stand with their arms crossed as if paying hom as if paying homage to the Lord as one equal to another. Now that's her own comment and it's interesting. The Virgin Mary said, Tell all the people that never is a man more manly than when he bends his knees before God. Now, at the words of consecration, the celebrant he was a person of normal height, but suddenly he began to grow, becoming filled with light, supernatural light between white and gold that enveloped him and grew very strong around the face. And because of it, I could not see his features. When he raised the host, I saw his hands, and on the back of his hands he had some marks from which emanated a great deal of light. It was Jesus. It was Jesus who was wrapping his body around the celebrant as if he were lovingly surrounding the hands of the Archbishop. At that moment the host began to grow and became enormous and upon it the marvellous face of Jesus appeared looking at his people. How well that moment of elevation, ostensation, of showing, of adoring, of enthroning Jesus should happen. It is a moment when the Lord is recognised as Lord physically. It should be done quietly and reverently without any attention drawn to any human being whatsoever. I instinctively wanted to bow my head. But Our Lady said, do not look down, look up to view and contemplate him. Exchange your gaze with his and repeat the prayer of Fatima. Lord, I believe, I adore, I trust and I love you. I ask pardon for those who do not believe, do not adore, do not trust and do not love you. Now tell him how much you love him and pay your homage to the King of Kings. Immediately the Archbishop said the words of consecration over the wine and as the words were being said lightning flashed from the heavens and in the background, the walls and ceiling of the church had disappeared. All was dark, but for the brilliant light from the altar. Suddenly, suspended in the air, I saw Jesus crucified. I saw him from the head to the lower part of the chest. The cross beam of the cross was sustained by some large, strong hands. From within this resplendent light, a small dove came and flew swiftly all over the church. It came to rest on the left shoulder of the Archbishop, who continued to appear as Jesus because I could distinguish his long hair. His luminous wounds and his large body, but I could not see his face. Above was Jesus crucified, his head fallen upon his right shoulder. I was able to contemplate his face beaten arms and torn flesh. On the right side of his chest 
He had an injury, and blood was gushing out towards the left side and towards the right side, what looked like water. But it was very brilliant. They were more like jets of light coming forth towards the faithful and moving to the right and to the left. I was amazed at the amount of blood that was flowing out towards the chalice. I thought it would overflow and stain the whole altar. Not a single drop was spilled. And then she heard this from the Blessed Virgin. This is the miracle of miracles. I have said to you before, the Lord is not constrained by time and space. At the moment of the consecration, all the assembly is taken to the foot of Calvary at the instant of the crucifixion of Jesus.